Hello, everybody. I have uh, some comments here at the top that I want to make, uh, certainly regarding what happened over the weekend. We uh, strongly condemn the recent spate of deadly terrorist attacks that have been focused on civilians, including women and children, and which have brutally taken hundreds of lives, from Istanbul to Dhaka to Baghdad to the attacks in Saudi Arabia. These, uh, uh, these acts have shown no respect for human life, whether young or old, male or female, Muslim or non-Muslim. These terrorists murdered without discretion. We cannot say whether these attacks were coordinated or whether they were conducted by independent opportunists. As you know, investigations are still ongoing, and I'm not going to get ahead of those processes. I'm referring to those countries to talk about it. But what we do know is that the goal of these attacks was to attract attention and to spread terror and to spread fear. They occurred during and at the end of Ramadan, the holiest time of the year for Muslims. Indeed, a Daesh spokesman himself called for targeting during this very holy month. So what's obviously evident uh, is that Daesh certainly has no respect for Muslim life, life in general, or any respect for Islam itself. Now, even as we continue to pressure Daesh in Iraq and Syria, we remain extremely concerned about their ability to inspire terrorist attacks that require few resources with little to no coordination uh, and we are working, obviously, with our partners to help spread this, uh, uh, to help halt, sorry, the spread of terror. We've always made clear that the military campaign is not enough to defeat Daesh or to remove the threat that it poses, that a holistic campaign that addresses the root causes of extremism is the only way to deliver a sustainable defeat. That's why we're working with partners from around the world to cut off Daesh's messaging, financing, and recruitment networks. That's why we work with partners. Uh, to expand the global ability to identify, disrupt, arrest, and prosecute suspected foreign terrorist fighters. And it's why we've identif identified concrete areas to increase partner capacity in disrupting, arresting, and prosecuting suspected foreign terrorist fighters and better information sharing uh, on their uh, networks. The United States now has information sharing agreements with 55 international partners to identify and track the travel of suspected terrorists. And the number of countries contributing foreign terrorist fighter pro profiles to Interpol has now increased by some 400 percent over the last two years alone. We're partnering with governments in areas including strengthening information sharing on known and suspected terrorists, implementing or enhancing counterterrorism legislation, increasing effective traveler screening, and strengthening border security, as well as uh, building comprehensive uh, financial investigations. This is and will remain a truly global effort. At least 35 countries now have arrested foreign terrorist fighters or aspirants, and 12 countries have successfully prosecuted foreign terrorist fighters. At least 45 countries have enacted laws or amendments to create greater obstacles for foreign terrorist fighters traveling into Iraq and Syria. And as you well know, the coalition itself is some 66 nations strong now. We're also focused on confronting and discrediting the violent messages that Daesh puts out on a daily basis on social media. Uh, that they try to use to inspire, to recruit people. We've seen that Daesh and those they inspire feed off their distorted narrative of this so-called caliphate. As we go after its network, we cannot lose focus on defeating uh, 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 this threat at its core in Iraq and Syria. And that's why we've accelerated our campaign against Daesh in Iraq and Syria and why we will continue to do so. Over the last six months, we've seen significant progress in this campaign as local partners on the ground have increased the tempo of efforts to retake territory across multiple fronts and diminish the group's finances and access uh, to additional manpower. This will continue. And we're well aware of the threat that Daesh poses to us as well as to our allies and partners. That's why we have galvanized this international coalition to shrink the territory that they hold, to kill their leaders, to cut off their financing, and to counter their messaging. And as you've heard the, pre uh, as you heard, uh, the president, uh, that, that campaign is firing on all cylinders, and it will continue to keep up until the job is done. But let me be clear. The threat of terrorists, and terror, terrorist attacks and terrorism, will be with us for a, a long time. And we know that. Uh, we're mindful of that. Uh, and I can tell you that we will and we must remain vigilant against that threat. I wanted right. to start with um, the announcement by the FBI director uh, regarding former Secretary of State Clinton. Um, First, do you have a response uh, to this announcement that no criminal charges will be sought? Uh, let me just uh, say at the outset, 
uh, Brad, the, the State Department uh, cooperated fully with the FBI's investigation, as you can understand. I'm not at liberty to share the details of that cooperation. Furthermore, the State Department does not have full insight into the FBI investigation, so it's going to be inappropriate for me to comment on their findings or on their recommendations. Secondly, the Department will determine the appropriate next steps following a decision by the Department of Justice. We're not going to get ahead of that. The Department has, as you know, an administrative process to evaluate cases where information may have been mishandled, as we have said previously, at the request of the FBI. The Department has not moved forward with that process to ensure that we did not interfere with the investigation. And as I said earlier, we're not also going to interfere with the process now before the Department of Justice. Uh, I just don't have any more updates uh, on the possible scope or timing of our process. So one of the, the word I think that kind of stood out in this regarding the State Department's equities was uh, careless. I think he even said extremely careless at one point uh, regarding the former secretary and how she handled her emails top staff around her, including some still at the department and the agency as a whole. Uh, do you agree that this agency was extremely careless with how it dealt with classified and otherwise sensitive information? Well, I'm not going to, again, comment on the specific findings uh, and recommendations uh, that the FBI director uh, noted today. Um, Why but the question about the, 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 the statement. The, the, the claim about, I do want to address this, cl the, the, the claim about a, a lax environment or culture uh, when it comes to uh, handling classified information. And I, I would just say, and, I, and, I, and I'm comfortable commenting on that because as the director himself said, that was not part of their investigation, um, uh, his, the, the, their assessment uh, of a lax environment or culture. We don't share that assessment of our institution. Um, that said, and I've said this many times before, we're always looking for ways to improve. We're going to continue to look for ways to improve. Uh, but we don't share uh, the, the, the broad assessment made of our institution that there's a lax culture here when it comes to uh, protecting classified information. Um, uh, we take it very, very seriously. Wait, I'm sorry. You don't share the assessment that when the former head of the agency had thousands of emails that you had to upgrade, including hundreds that were over a hundred that were classified at the time, that that doesn't amount to lax approach to classified information? I mean, how many hundreds would you need for it to be lax, in your opinion? Uh, what I'm saying, Brad, is that as a, a cultural assessment of the, in, uh, of the State Department as an institution, that we have a lax culture here, we don't share that assessment. Yeah. And as the director said himself, that's, that wasn't part of their investigation or the findings and recommendations that they made inside that investigation. Well, but... So it's not, it's true that it was not the scope of their investigation, but in looking at her emails and the number of officials that were emailing her about classified information, that's where they came to the determination that there was a lax culture. So, I mean, I guess you would have to look at every single employee and see what their treatment of email to determine that it's a lax culture. But clearly um, the FBI found enough um, you know, Secretary Clinton's intent or whatever notwithstanding, um, that generally that there were a lot of officials and the, that they came across in the scope of this investigation, which led them to believe that the culture is not taken as seriously as it could be. Well, I'll let the FBI director speak to the, the, their findings and recommendations in his investigation, as he should. The question was, do I share, do we share uh, the assessment of the culture at the, of the, in, at the institution of the State Department to be lax? And we do not share that assessment. We so take think, it very seriously. Here. Well, clearly he found it in this previous administration, so in the previous term. So you're saying that maybe that there was a lax culture that doesn't exist anymore? No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that at all, at least. I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not parsing words here. I'm saying that the State Department has in the past and and does today take the treatment of classified information very seriously. Um, so it was just and a few when we bad and apples? when we have pardon? So it's just a few people that uh, did not take enough care? I, I'm not I'm not going to speak to uh, any, any more specifically about the findings and recommendations that the FBI made and announced today. What I can tell you is uh, we don't share uh, the broad assessment uh, that there's a lax culture here at the State Department when it comes to dealing with classified information. Quite the contrary, we take it more, very seriously. I have one more. Can you, um, 
the FBI director said that had some of these people still been in office, that they would have been subject or could have been subject to administrative penalties. Is anybody that's currently um, employed by the State Department going to have any notes in their files as a result um, of anything that their emails uncovered in, in terms of their communications? And then also, some of the previous employees that worked for Secretary Clinton that were found to have exchanged what is now believed to be classified information, are they going to have kind of um, posthumous notes put in their file should they ever seek to be employed by the U.S. government again? And does the State Department do that, or does the FBI do that, and is that through OPM? Like, what's the process there? So let me answer it this way, um, and I think I alluded to this at the top. We're going to determine the appropriate next steps following a decision by the Department of Justice, and that's where this really lays right now. We have, as you know, and I've said, we have an administrative process to evaluate cases where information may have been mishandled, and as I've said previously, uh, at the request of the FBI, uh, we didn't move forward with that process so as not to interfere with their investigation. We also don't believe that it's appropriate at this time, given that there are, that, that the matter is now before the Department of Justice to determine their next step, to make decisions or not to make decisions. We don't think it's appropriate for us to continue to, to move forward uh, on that at this time. So um, I, I just don't have an update for you uh, on, uh, uh, on any possible timing or scope uh, uh, of that review process. So what would be the, um so once the Department of Justice makes their recommendation, then you would determine what administrative processes you want to move forward with? I, I think we need to wait to see what the Justice Department decides to do now uh, in the wake of the FBI investigation before we, we move forward one way or the other. And we want to allow the proper time and space for that before uh, we decide anything further with respect to, uh, to those issues. A couple of detailed questions on this, and if you don't have the answers, if you could undertake to, to take them. Um, uh, as it's been explained to me, there are two separate processes that can be undertaken here. One of them is an administrative process, and the other is a security clearance related process. As it's been explained to me, but I'd like to confirm, the administrative process governs solely people who are currently employed by the Department of State. So can you confirm that that's the case, that administrative processes or sanctions don't apply to people who are no longer employed by state? Second, uh, as it's been explained to me, it is possible for uh, people who are no longer employed at state but who retain a security clearance to uh, be subject to a security clearance process and perhaps sanction. Uh, is that your understanding as well? Um, and then a couple of other specific things. Are any, is, does Secretary, former Secretary Clinton or any of her senior aides, specifically uh, Cheryl Mills, Jake Sullivan, and Huma Abedin, continue to have security clearances provided by the State Department? Uh, and if so, uh, is it theoretically possible that you would then review those security clearances in the light of whatever is ultimately the Justice Department prosecutorial decision and the FBI's investigative material. Now, there's an awful lot there. Let me see if I can dissect it. I'm, I'm certainly not going to get ahead of what is still an ongoing process now at the Justice Department um, or speculate one way or the other about which way this will go. I don't know. I'm happy to ask the question, your question about administrative processes. I, I don't know uh, if there's a technical definition for administrative and whether that applies in broad scope to only current employees or former employees. I'll have to, I'll have to take that. Um, on this, uh, the security clearance uh, process or review, all, all I can tell you, generally speaking, is that, is that um, if there is a need, and I'm speaking broadly, not to this, uh, that the way it typically works, as I understand it, is the, the, the department that issues a security clearance, if there is, if it's determined that that clearance needs to be reviewed for whatever reason, it's up to that, it's up to the department that issued it 
to review it, regardless of whether the employee is still at the uh, is is still employed by the agency. The agency has that responsibility, uh, unless of course that employee went to a different federal agency and then got it renewed there. Does that make sense? I'm not going to speculate one way or another about about the degree to which this is uh, this is even a part of it. The, uh, the the FBI director was very careful. I'm going to be very careful. These these are now decisions that have to be uh, discussed. The findings and recommendations now have to be um, uh, absorbed by the Department of Justice, and then they make they'll make decisions or not going forward. And then on your last question about the individuals, uh, uh, we, we do not discuss uh, the security clearance of, of individuals as a matter of policy. We just don't discuss In, it. But these are, these are former officials. We, we don't. We, we do not discuss it. One of them, Jake Sullivan, in the transcript of his deposition in the civil lawsuit in which uh, he was deposed as part of discovery, his lawyer said that his security clearance was restored so that he would have the ability to look at some of the material that was classified that they wanted to talk to him about. And so it's at least in the public domain in that one instance, according to his lawyer, that he had as of that date about a week ago yeah. a security clearance. Why, why can't you talk about whether former officials have security clearances? Because that's our policy, and um, uh, it's been longstanding policy. We do not discuss the security clearance uh, uh, levels uh, or access of individuals, uh, current or former. We just don't. That's our policy, and I'm not going to violate that. Is it a State that. Department policy or a government-wide policy? I know it's at least a State Department policy, at least. I'll find out if it goes beyond that. Because uh, certainly there have been instances, whether it's General Petraeus or Sandy Berger or others, that when there was punitive action taken, they did discuss the security clearance. I'm not, I'm not going to discuss the individual security clearances from this podium. I'm just not going to do it. And and if there's, you know, I refer you to the individuals in question and if they're represented by uh, by others to, to speak to that, but I won't do that. Just one more on the, on the question of lax, laxity. Um, uh, you state that you disagree with the assessment that the State Department was, is lax, has a culture of being lax in the protection of classified information. Um, why is it that the highest State Department official was allowed to establish and use a private email server with, as I understand it, no government provided security uh, for emails that contain information that as the FBI director said this morning some of which was classified at the time it was sent and received I mean if, if, if it's not lax how can the top official of the department go off and set up their own system that isn't subject to the normal procedures here well look, I'm not gonna Relitigate uh, uh, the investigation. As I said, I'm not going to speak to the findings and recommendations. The FBI director uh, uh, s spoke to that uh, earlier today, into into what, what they found uh, in uh, in terms of the practices uh, back then um, and, and how those practices were were followed. Um, what I'll just tell you. Broadly speaking, uh, we don't share the assessment that as an institution, an entire institution that the State Department has in the past or does today, take lightly uh, the issue of sensitive and classified information. Uh, we absolutely don't. Well, uh, the, reason, the, reason I, the reason I asked it is that you look at, as I understand it, kind of every level of potential check or balance here, right? the assistant secretaries for DS, the undersecretary for management. According to the inspector general's report, these people were not asked and did not voice an opinion on the use of this system. Uh, the person on the seventh floor who was charged with these kinds of issues, at least according to the report, told people, told two people not to talk to anybody about it. So even if the quibble is with the word laxity, 
do you feel that your systems were sufficient to safeguard classified information sent by or to the Secretary of State? Again, I think the FBI director addressed that uh, as well as part of their investigation. I'm, I am simply not going to discuss uh, uh, or comment on their findings or recommendations with respect to this case. Well, this issue, wait a second, Elise, wait, wait, and to your question. Uh, and, and as he said himself, uh, his assessment of the State Department's culture was not part of his investigation, and that's why I'm, I, I, I'm comfortable addressing that, that on, uh, as a whole, in the main, we absolutely do not share the broad assessment that the entire culture here at the State Department is lax when it comes to protecting sensitive and classified information. And what I'm basing that on, Brad, is, is the, the, the long-standing, and I don't just mean recently, the long-standing uh, training and indoctrination that one goes through uh, before you get employed here. And the periodic reviews of the training and, uh, uh, and uh, sensitive information handling that you have to go through. Uh, all the time. I've been here a little bit more than a year. I've already had to go, go through it several times myself. Um, that that, uh, that you, we have two networks uh, for email traffic that are deliberately set up to handle you know, various degrees uh, of sensitive information. And that the work of diplomats all around the world uh, uh, is by its, is by it, its very nature's uh, sensitive, but it's also outward facing and and has to be. Um, and there's a role here uh, at the State Department uh, to be communicative, uh, uh, to have dialogue, to foster communication. Uh, that's a big part of who we are. and I can and I, and I can tell you that, that that everybody involved in that understands the risks and the opportunities of it and takes it very seriously. Uh, so to say to say that the to say that the culture here, uh, is is lax. Uh, that's a pretty broad brush, and again, we wouldn't use it. We don't we don't believe it. The problem is this indoctrination that you speak of obviously didn't work when it came to the past secretary or the hundred or so officials who all contacted her during the course of her tenure, or the dozens of officials who would have known that she wasn't using a state.gov address or would have known that. Uh, information that was at least on the borderline was going to a non-government account. So that failed across the board, right? I, I'm not. I'm not going to make a, a, a qualitative assessment. Much. The IG spoke uh, as well to this. I'm not going to talk about the findings and recommendations of this investigation. Well, but exactly. this was. But but there is a difference, Brad, between uh, an assessment of email practices. Uh, uh, under Secretary Clinton's tenure, uh, and uh, and how they were implemented, and saying that the culture here at the State Department is lax. Okay, well, yeah, but they, no, 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 hold on. But sorry, you can't separate the head of the agency and everybody who worked around her at a senior level in this in this agency and right, say, and I'm not trying to. Well. There were somebody out there who was following the rules, so the culture was okay. It's more than somebody, Brad. Well, I don't, I don't know. Show me an IG report that shows all the adherence. Um, and secondly, you're, you're making this case about how the State Department was an out, is an outward-looking agency. Yeah. None of these emails from Secretary Clinton were outward-focused. They were all about internal messaging. They were all about her and her aides consulting on matters that sure. weren't meant for public consumption. Sure. And there's even messages about not wanting things out for public consumption. So I fail to see how that's an argument that shows why somehow this is distinct or excusable. It's a, it's a valid um, argument when you're talking about the entire institution, Brad, and not an individual inside it, regardless of whatever level that individual serves. To make a broad assessment, and look, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not gonna. I, I think I've said it plenty of times already. To make a broad assessment of the entire institution, uh, uh, that it was lax, or that we don't care, or we don't take it seriously, we don't, we don't share it. Uh, now, now, look, as I also said, we're always looking for ways to improve, uh, and if there's, uh, if there's ways we can learn 
uh, from this particular investigation uh, to improve, then we'll do that. So, John, okay, so I think it's pretty clear what you're taking issue with is that you're interpreting, you're interpreting the FBI director's comments to mean a culture throughout the whole State Department apparatus. And I think his, what he's trying to say is based on, and they did not, the scope of their investigation was not the, the whole State Department. It was Secretary Clinton and, you know, the immediate staff mm -hmm. and, and several other dozen officials that were emailing her, um, that there was a lax culture among a subset of State Department officials. That I don't think he's making an indictment on the whole State Department, but he is saying that there was a culture inside the State Department where the security was lax. I mean, the fact that this took place kind of indicates that it was. And he does also say that that this use of a personal e email domain was known by a large number of people and readily apparent. So there were numerous people inside the State Department that knew that she was using this type of system. So how can you not, if you don't want to acknowledge that there was a lax culture in the whole kind of State Department bureaucracy, can you not acknowledge that among a subset of employees at the time that there was a lax, a culture of lax security among that subset? Well, I'll let the investigation speak for itself and the FBI director just speak for it. But by you kind of parsing out and saying that this, let me finish, that that by you parsing out and saying that the whole building doesn't have a lack security problem suggests that you're dismissing that a small portion did? I, I'm not suggesting any such thing, Elise. As I said, we cooperated with the FBI on its investigation. I, I can't talk about the, the scope of that cooperation. I'm not going to, again, address the specific findings and, and recommendations that he made. And, and the director has spoken. Uh, for their investigative work, and uh, I would refer you to him and to his staff to speak to uh, uh, to speak to it going forward. Um, and I don't have his exact quote, uh, so I can't tell you, uh, you know, if if I've misinterpreted or not. I mean, uh, he he can speak for himself in in terms of what he meant. The way we interpreted it was that it was a broad brush assessment uh, of the culture. Uh, here at the State Department, uh, when it came to uh, when do it came not, to, do you not agree that a group of people, however large it was, that knew about this system and let it kind of green lighted it and let it go forward and didn't ask questions about it, suggests that security and a, a, Look, a our, culture our, of security our, was lacked somewhere. In our the our Inspector General himself found that there were that the uh, that uh, that there were lapses and that uh, not all appropriate practices were conducted. I mean, I'm, nobody's taking issue with that. What I'm taking issue with, and the only thing I'm taking issue with today, because I'm not going to comment, as I said, on the specifics, the only thing I'm taking issue with is an assessment, a broad assessment of the culture of the institution, which we do not share. Uh, from today, the director of the FBI said that the FBI had found over a hundred emails that contained classified information at the time that they were sent or received, and some were even actually marked classified. So that contradicts what the State Department has been saying throughout this investigation. So how do you square the two? As I said, I'm not going to comment on the specific findings and recommendations uh, of the investigation. Would you, though, at least acknowledge that something else that he said in his comment, he said that you know, the 100, 110 emails have been determined by the owning agency to contain classified information. So do you now acknowledge that it is the owning agency's responsibility, not the recipient's or even necessarily the State Department in determining what information is classified and what's not? Again, what I would tell you is we cooperated fully with the FBI on, on this. Um, and I'm not going to comment specifically on the findings of the investigation. As much as I know you'd like me to, I'm not going to do that. There is now there is a process here in place where the Department of Justice is going to take a look at this. We're going to let that process play out, as we should. Um, and uh, we'll await any pending decisions by the Department of Justice before the State Department moves forward one way or another. John, the possibility that people up? hostile to the U.S. had possibly gained access. I'm sorry? Or what about the possibility that states or entities hostile to the U.S. had possibly gained access uh, to some of the content 
uh, of those emails. Uh, do you share that those concerns that uh, the FBI director said today? Well, again, we, of course, take security of our systems very, very seriously. And we're always concerned about intrusions in, in, into our system. Um, and I think the director also said that uh, they didn't find any direct evidence that the system was was compromised, but I don't have additional details to offer today. But he also said that you couldn't be sure, and that a lot, and it's possible that they did so, and you don't even know about it. Uh, again, we're always concerned about this. And look, federal government systems uh, 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 get attacked every day. I just don't have any additional oh, details not, on this. You're not suggesting that because government systems are hacked that there was enough security in place that would replace I'm not that would be equal to the government uh, I, the government security the FBI director specifically said that it was not it was not as secure as a government system or even a Gmail account again I'm not going to discuss or debate well, you the, were the one that raised it you said government of computers get hacked or government systems doesn't mean we get don't take it seriously at least Carol I believe the FBI director made a point of saying that you were lax in comparison to elsewhere within government. Do you believe that you stand up equally to other agencies in the government, including national security agencies like the FBI and the CIA, the White House and the Pentagon? Do you think you are equal to them? Uh, I think, it, look, first of all, that everybody has a, everybody in the federal government has standard rules. Uh, that, that cross-cut agencies in, in terms of how sensitive and classified information is treated uh, and dealt with. We all have the same basic rules. Um, but uh, each federal agency also has a, a fundamental different purpose. And each of the major federal agencies has to, by dint of their purpose, look at the world in different ways. As I said to Brad, uh, uh, we we are required, not just not just that we like it. We are required to be outward facing. We're required to communicate. We're required to foster dialogue. We're required to have conversations with uh, foreign leaders and in foreign countries all around the world every single day. Now that doesn't obviate, doesn't excuse, it doesn't mean that we're not also responsible in the conduct of that business to protect sensitive information. We have to. Uh, but the State Department, unique to many, unique, I think, among federal agencies, um, has an actual obligation to communicate. So it, so that's why I'm confident in saying that, that uh, look, do we always get it right? No. Have we admitted that there were things we, we uh, could have done better in the past? Absolutely. The IG found that. The Secretary himself has taken steps to, to try to improve records management here. Um, but we have an obligation to communicate. And, uh, and you have to find the right balance uh, between the need to do that, to foster dialogue, to try to gain better understanding of what somebody else thinks and, and articulate your policy at the same time protecting sensitive information. So we have a different role. I don't think it's useful uh, to compare each and every federal agency with the way uh, you know, with the way they do this, uh, because each of them have different responsibilities in terms of the information environment. But again, I'm not at all excusing anything in terms of our responsibilities, our baseline responsibilities, which every federal agency has, to protect classified and sensitive information. Hey, yeah. According to a letter dated February 18th, 2016, from uh, Julia Fryfield, the Assistant Secretary, Affair, uh, Assistant Secretary for Legislative Affairs, to um, Chairman Grassley, uh, the letter explicitly discloses that uh, Cheryl Mills uh, did uh, maintain a top secret, well, did maintain a security clearance because pursuant to section 4.2, Four point four of Executive Order thirteen five twenty six, she was uh, designated by former Secretary Clinton to assist her in research consistent with that section of the Executive Order. So, you do disclose, you do talk about um, security clearances at least in this one instance <clears throat> with regard to That's a, that. Ms. You're talking Mills. about a, a, a piece of correspondence between the head of Legislative Affairs here and. 
a senator. That's different than public disclosure, uh, certainly different than disclosure and talking about it here from the podium. As I said, our policy is not to discuss it, and I'm not going to change the policy here today. Even though you've told lawmakers about it. That is not the same as having a, a public discussion of security clearance. That's a, that's a vastly different thing. Is it? Why, that wasn't a classified letter? Just because something's not classified doesn't mean that it's well, that it's okay that. to to discuss here at the at the podium, Brad. I mean, I look, the, the, uh, I'm not going to violate. Isn't the marker for I'm not going to violate the policy today. So, are you okay, are you okay to move on? Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, let me ask about uh, Iraq. Uh, as you started at the top, it was miserable. It was a terrible weekend. Uh, end of that. Uh, also, the, uh, the the head of the anti-terror committee for the United Nations said that there could be as many as 30,000 foreign fighters going back from Syria and Iraq to their yeah. own countries yeah. and, and recover. I mean, it, is that, you know, all along the issue of the open borders and, in fact, Turkey allowing all these fighters to go into Syria and Iraq would probably come back to haunt them. I mean, it, that's something that's in hindsight. But what is being done to really now seal off that border to prevent such a thing? Well, there's been a lot of work to, to, uh, to do exactly that, and the Turks are working very hard at this. And, uh, and we continue to be in very close consultation with them as they try to do exactly that. And they have made strides, and the flow has, uh, has decreased. Uh, but I think the Turkish government will be the first to tell you that they realize they still have an issue along that border, and they're and they're, they're still working at it. But it has decreased. We've seen that. Well, I'll tell you what: if these foreign fighters want to leave and go back to their home country, they either have to go through the Turkish border or the Jordanian uh, border. I mean, it seems that this is pretty, you know, the the only two available gateways back to there. Could you? Uh, uh, the, the, could the United States? work closely to ensure that these borders are sealed off to prevent these Could they add what? Could they add? Could you take measures along with the Jordanian government and the Turkish government, but it would be something under under your own auspices to ensure that the flow of fighters is cut off? You know, we're working closely. Back. We're working closely with with both governments uh, on their border concerns, and they and these are these are not philosophical problems. They, they they're tangible. They're real, and they and these governments uh, understand that. Uh, and we continue to to, to talk to them uh, about ways in which we can be helpful uh, uh, in their efforts to secure their borders. Uh, but believe me, this is a con this is an issue of of constant uh, conversation. Uh, between us and the government uh, of Jordan, as well as uh, between us and, and the government of Turkey. And finally, today the Minister of Interior, the Iraqi Minister of Interior, submitted his resignation, saying that he assumed responsibility, but he's not getting any cooperation from uh, Hyder Abadi or the Iraqi government. Do you have any comment on that? I, I've seen the press reporting uh, uh, that's uh, uh, about the this resignation, I can't confirm the veracity of those reports. I'd refer you to the government of Iraq to, to speak to that. Uh, but I would uh, would say, uh, broadly speaking, without getting into this particular case, that the, the Prime Minister body is well aware of the challenges that his government faces on the ground uh, by, uh, uh, by groups like Daesh. And he's well aware of the reforms, political, economic, and yes, continued military reforms that that need to continue to be made, and we're going to continue to support them in those efforts. A um, couple of quick things. Can you offer any assessment with regard to whether you believe the multiple attacks that occurred over the weekend, notably those in Turkey, Iraq, and Bangladesh, uh, were coordinated? No, as I said at the top, we, we don't know okay. that. Do you have, at the top, you said that you have, I think, information sharing uh, agreements with 55 uh, international partners. Are those countries, or does that include non-countries, but like Interpol or something it's else? Largely with countries. And do those include Turkey, Bangladesh, and Saudi Arabia? I'm not at liberty to detail the countries. Why? Uh, well, I mean, there's lots of arrangements that we have with uh, nations around the world that, uh, for various reasons, uh, sensitivity uh, uh, domestically, that they, they prefer not for us to make public. So we just don't. 
Oh, wait, before we leave the Middle East, I think Brad wanted to go to. Uh, so why don't, let me let me come back. Let here. me follow on the Middle East quickly. One, uh, as far as this bombing in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia is concerned, many people I have been talking here. They are very surprised who go to, to the uh, Makkah Medina for their pilgrims and all that. They have never heard anything like this. How surprised was this to the U.S. that these kind of things also happened in in this place of Saudi Arabia? Well, I, I think I addressed this at the top, Goy. I mean, uh, f first of all, we've been mindful for quite some time that, first of all, you know, terrorist attacks, is, that's not a new thing for Daesh. Uh, it, it's a part and parcel of, uh, of their overarching efforts to spread fear, to try to ins inspire uh, recruits, um, and to try to uh, uh, dominate. Uh, in many cases, local populations. So this is a this is a tactic they have used since the very beginning. We have also been mi very mindful as they have gotten under more pressure in Iraq and Syria that um, that they would um, increasingly uh, find themselves drawn to those kinds of conventional terror tactics, um, and uh, and that's what they're doing. And as I said last week, I think it was uh, that mindful that we have been about their motives and about uh, the tactics they uh, are using or continue to use or increasingly use, uh, we too uh, are, are adapting uh, as well. And I, at the, at the top, I went through a litany of things that, that we have done uh, in recent months um, to try to get a better handle on the flow of foreign fighters, their financing, their ability to recruit, their ability to message, and frankly, their ability to, to operate. And um, though it doesn't make the same level of headlines, there have been, uh, uh, over the last year alone, uh, dozens of arrests, if not more. Uh, 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 and we don't know how many, uh, as a result of the great work that uh, law enforcement and intelligence communities around the world are doing, we don't know how many attacks have been prevented. But we do know that, that some have been. It doesn't mean that we take each one any less seriously. It doesn't mean uh, that there isn't the potential for more. Uh, this, is a, this is a tactic that doesn't, as I said, require a lot of resources, doesn't require uh, uh, all that amount of sophisticated coordination in every sense, um, and we all need to stay vigilant uh, for the potential for future attacks, and we are. You think because of this, uh, uh, Saudis will reach to the U.S. more than ever in the past, and now the Middle East will be united against the terrorism. I think you're already seeing. I think you're already look. There's no, there's no, there's no nation in the world that supports Daesh, and um, you're already starting to see uh, uh, the Middle East uh, coalesce around uh, trying to get at this very significant threat. Yeah. Do you have a comment on the, uh, unless you were going to ask about Iraq? I, I, Russia, Turkey. Uh, do you have a comment on uh, the Israeli settlement construction announcement? Uh, we're aware of reports that the government of Israel uh, intends to advance plans for hundreds of housing units in Israeli settlements in the West Bank as well as East Jerusalem. If it's true, uh, this report will be the latest step in what seems to be a systematic process of land seizures, settlement expansions, and legalizations of outposts that is fundamentally undermining the prospects for a two-state solution. We oppose steps like these, uh, which we believe are counterproductive to the cause of, uh, of peace. In general, we're deeply concerned about settlement construction and expansion in East Jerusalem and the West Bank, and the design and the I'm sorry, the designation of land throughout the West Bank for exclusive Israeli use, as the Quartet report highlights. Since the beginning of the Oslo process in 1993, the population of settlements has more than doubled, with a threefold increase in Area C alone. Currently, there is at least 570,000 Israeli settlers living in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Moreover, approximately 100 settlement outposts in Area C have been built without former Israeli government approval, making them illegal even under Israeli law. So again, as the uh, Quartet report makes clear, these actions risk entrenching a one-state reality uh, and raise serious questions about Israel's uh, long-term intentions. Given that you, you raised 
the idea of this as a systematic process of land land expropriation or land seizures or however, however you put it. Um, what is what is the U.S.'s systematic response beyond just saying this is bad every time? Do you have a systematic approach to uh, counteracting this yeah. trend that is blocking peace? In your opinion, uh, our approach has been uh, consistent throughout. Uh, first of all calling it like we see it and not being afraid to do that, having tough discussions with uh, Israeli leaders about this and being willing to continue to do that, working inside the, the quartet, and the quartet report addresses this pretty clearly, as I just said, uh, as well as working with uh, other members of the international community uh, to try to see if we can advance a, a, a two-state solution. Um, do you, do you the, the way I understood it was this is a response to the violence. Do you see the notion of settlement expansion as a consequence of violence as an appropriate uh, countermeasure? Look, I'm, I really am loath to get into analyzing uh, cause and effect here uh, in terms of you know, connecting that particular uh, dot. We're obviously deeply concerned uh, about violence and we condemn the recent attacks. There's, uh, and we've said this before, no justification for terrorism, no justification for the violence, no justification for the taking or, or maiming of innocent life. Uh, and, uh, 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 and so we're going to continue to, to look for leaders in the region to do what they need to do, take the affirmative steps that are required, enact, demonstrate leadership uh, to, to take down the, the tensions, to reduce the violence, to get us uh, to help create the conditions for a, a two-state solution. That, that, that doesn't change, however, at all, our opposition uh, to settlement activity, which we uh, believe is illegitimate. I, I have a last one, uh, tangentially related. Uh, the wife of a, a man killed in a West Bank attack uh, was an American citizen. I think the car was shot at, and it was just another American. I think it might have been Hebron. Uh, Another American who almost died in this case. Uh, are you having conversations with the Palestinians about the rising American death toll in uh, this wave of violence? Well, obviously, we're, uh, any death and any injury is significant um, uh, when it results from this sort of uh, violence. Um, and so our conversations with, uh, with leaders on both sides are, are about uh, again, taking steps to reduce the violence so that so that innocent people can go about their lives. All innocent people can go about their lives. Well, your, your, that, that, your first job is to protect Americans, and we take that and very and we are, take that very seriously. I, 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 well, there a lot. There's there's been several now. I think killed in this wave of violence yeah. uh, more than in a lot of places. We where take you, that. No, we take that very seriously. But but deeper engagement. But, well, I'm not going to. Even military De engagement in some places. I'm not going to detail the specifics of diplomatic discussions we may be having on this. I can tell you, obviously, we take that responsibility very seriously, but more broadly speaking, we want to see uh, all innocent life protected. And do you think that Palestinian attackers are attacking Americans on purpose? Do you think that they are targeting Americans? As I said, I'm not going to analyze each and every uh, uh, a specific act here from the, the podium side. Just to follow up on, on Brad's uh, question, do you ask the Palestinians to investigate whether there's actually been deliberate attacking or deliberate targeting of Americans? We want, first of all, we want the attacks to stop. Right. I understand, but, you know, things and that obviously, taken place. Obviously, we would, we, and we've said this before, you know, we welcome thorough, complete investigations on, on these matters, transparent investigations. Uh, uh, by all sides, uh, but I'm not going to get into a, a discussion of each and every one. Uh, according to the Israeli press, the Palestinian Authority is getting ready to cut off all relation with the quartet because they feel that the, the report is completely biased towards Israel. First of all, are you aware of these reports? And second, are you having a conversation with the Palestinians on this very issue? I, I think what we've seen is a PLO statement uh, that takes issue with some aspects of the quartet report, um, and that's, that's our understanding, is that, uh, that this is more a statement of uh, their concerns and objections to the report itself. And as I said last week, we fully expected that there would be objections, that there would be concerns, that not everybody would like everything that they read in there. But I'll say it, like I said last week, I'll say it again, 
both sides had input, and we and uh, and we we valued, welcomed, and valued that input. Uh, Goyle, I already got you. You did I get you yet? No. no. Go ahead. Um, just a follow up to a question I asked you last Thursday about the possible consequences of this Turkish uh, Russian reconciliation for Syria. Since I asked my question, the Financial Times reported. Um, a, the dynamics of a possible deal, to quote from them, Turkey's priority will be subduing Kurdish rivals and weakening ISIS, aims for which you could expect Russian support in exchange for Ankara dropping its demand for regime change in Syria. So first part of my question, is that a scenario that the U.S. thinks possible, and is it concerned, and if so, is it concerned about such an outcome? And second part of the question, has have U.S. authorities had any feedback from Turkey or Russia, Turkish or Russian officials about the nature of their reconciliation and its implications for the Syrian civil war? Well, let me let me try to carve it this way. Uh, 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 as I said last week, to the degree this um, improved relationship can lead or or uh, accelerate efforts against Daesh. Uh, particularly inside Syria, um, uh, yeah, then we would welcome that, um, and, uh, and and we've said that all along, uh, even with respect to Russia, uh, to the degree that they were willing to focus their efforts against Daesh in Syria, that that was a conversation we'd be willing to have with them. And Turkey's a NATO ally. Turkey is uh, uh, a member of the coalition, and Turkey has uh, cooperated and provided support uh, to that very end. Um, and if uh, if the these discussions, this relationship uh, between uh, uh, Turkey and Russia again can accelerate that uh, that effort, then uh, then obviously that that would be welcome. And and as to uh, the specific uh, arrangements that they made uh, between one another, they they would have to speak to that. I, I don't believe we have visibility uh, on uh, every nuance. Uh, and every bit of context uh, in, in those conversations. What is it at the cost of leaving Assad in power? Our position on Assad has not changed. It's not changed. That he should go? We continue to believe uh, that he can't be uh, a part of the long-term future of Syria, that the Syrian people deserve a government that's responsible for them, responsive to their needs, not barrel bombing them. Uh, and so nothing's changed about our view uh, of Assad. Yeah. But, uh, I was wondering if you might be able to give us some more information about Secretary Kerry's visit to Georgia. What message Secretary is going to deliver in Tbilisi? Well, look, I, I, I talked about this yesterday. Uh, I'm sorry, last week uh, when we uh, announced the trip. He's very much looking forward to it. As I think you know, he leaves uh, this evening. Um, I'm not going to get ahead of uh, uh, reading out meetings that haven't happened yet. Uh, but as I said last week, he's very much looking forward to uh, um, uh, to talking to them about our bilateral relationships and ways in which that relationship can continue to improve. Okay. Uh, Georgia has some challenges. Uh, countries uh, trying to come closer to NATO. Also, Georgia is expecting visa liberalization with the European Union, and there is some. You know, this is election year. Uh, is sector going to address all these challenges during his meeting? I think I'll let the secretary speak for his meetings once he's had them. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.